All right. Well, thanks for um, having us here tonight. And I brought along um, five of our campers uh, from this year. Um, so we have Grace, K-E-8-R-J-U uh, up in Michigan. And uh, you probably, if you've worked satellites, you've probably heard her on. Um, she's, she's on quite a bit. Um, as well as HF. And then we have uh, Katie, K-E-A-L-Q-R, who is up in Northeast Ohio. And uh, we have Abby Kimmy, K-K-7-C-F-J from Arizona. And we have Anderson Ray, just uh, about an hour and a half south of me or so uh, in uh, Southern Kentucky, K-4-R-A-Y. And we have Kaylee out in Idaho, K-I-7-T-X-N. So uh, as we go through <coughs> the uh, some of the videos uh, tonight, what I will ask uh, them to do is to just kind of chime in with their commentary, their, their thoughts, favorite things that um, we did on that particular day, um, and that kind of thing. And, and then we can get into some, uh, Q and a when we get done. So let me get this screen share thing going here and we'll, uh, get started. Okay. All right. I think we got it here. Um, so I was the, um, camp director for the first and second year, um, we're working on kind of transitioning, um, the leadership more to, uh, a youth based leadership. Um, we did a lot of that this year. Um, we're, we're going to do some more next year. Um, we haven't talked about the exact details yet, but, um, one of the things that makes Youth on the Air very different from other youth programs is that we, we really try to have the youth doing all the teaching. Um, the, the adults are there to kind of oversee and ensure safety and, and, and kind of direct um, the young people, but we really try to keep as many of the sessions run by young people as possible rather than the experts. And, and this is uh, based on what they've done in, in uh, Europe with youngsters on the air. Um, but it also actually is, is scientifically proven uh, that students typically will not ask uh, teachers or professors like me or uh, you know, older people questions. They'll just kind of take it all in and then they ask each other questions. And so we really wanted to, to work on retaining our young people. So it is a prerequisite that you have a license before you come to the camp. Um, and we want to build a community of young hams so that they have things like this, uh, that, you know, people can share their expertise with each other in a, in a peer group. Um, so that they're more likely to stay involved and, and it, it seems to be working uh, very well. So uh, that's what makes us a little different from um, a lot of other programs. We are, we are not a, a camp uh, to send a kid to to get a license. That, that, that is not at all our focus. Yes, we need to recruit young people. Uh, yes, we, we have to do that. And yes, we want to encourage that and find ways to do that. But our focus is really on retaining the young people that we do have, because we do have a lot of youth in ham radio. They're just very distant and disconnected. Um, almost every time I go to a club meeting, there's at least one, maybe two young people there. They don't know each other exists. And so that's what we're trying to do here. Um, so we promote all youth programs. Uh, we are not the youth program. Uh, we are a camp retention program and we have uh, some, some other programs, but we don't try to say, you know, well, you know, this one's better than that one. 
we work together and promote each other. Uh, we also have a, an activity called December Yoda Month um, that is run by the Youngsters on the Air um, group over in Europe. Um, and they've been doing this for uh, 11 years now. Um, and it's a special event where everyone operating in the special event is age 26 or under, or under 26, I should say, 25 or under. Um, we, usually over here, we say 25 or under. Over there, they say under 26. Uh, just different, different cultural things, kind of like with youngsters on the air versus youth on the air. It's the same thing, it's the same, same program, just different uh, cultural differences um, to explain it. But anyway, uh, the December Yoda month uh, is, a, is a chance for the young people to get on the air with special event call signs for the entire month and make cues. So uh, that's open to anyone under 26. Um, and then our summer camp program, we just finished our second summer camp um, and it is for ages 15 to 25, although this year we, we were skewing a little younger. Uh, we were 14 to 21 this year. Um, so we're, we're looking at um, opportunities for under 15 um, because there's a lot of hams that I'm meeting that I'm not old enough to go to camp. So we're, we're working on another camp uh, for them. Uh, but anyway, this special event, um, th the last couple of years, they've been averaging right around 120,000 cues. Um, so here in the, uh, in the U.S., we have K8Y, K8O, K8T, and K8A. Um, and then um, outside of the U.S., everyone has the four-letter suffix Y-O-T-A uh, for this special event. Um, so we want to encourage all young people to sign up to share these four call signs throughout the month. Um, they, the um, leaders, Bryant, KG5HVO, and Case, W0AAE, come up with a schedule, and they organize that, and who gets what call on what day, and um, collect all the logs, and, and we, we send them all in. Um, but our summer camp program is our big uh, claim to fame. Um, we just uh, finished that up here in uh, greater Cincinnati. It was on the northern side of Cincinnati. I'm way down here so far south. I'm in Kentucky. Um, but at the Voice of America Museum up in Westchester. Um, and again, it's for and by young hams. So we have young people leading uh, a lot of the sessions on the working group to make a lot of the decisions. Um, and we're trying to build those, those uh, peer groups. Um, we had 21 campers this year. Uh, eight of them are returning campers. So they were there to help. We kind of split up uh, a lot of our uh, returning campers so that we don't have them the same ones every year. It's kind of mix things up. Um, so uh, we chose eight to, to come this year um, to kind of help out and guide the new campers along. Um, our keynote speaker was uh, Dr. Nathaniel Frizzell, W2NAF, the founder of HamSci, which he's, you know, he's in his 30s. Um, that looks like he, he's fresh out of college. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he came and told us a lot of the things that he's been able to do through Ham Radio. Um, and then we had several adult volunteers and staff members that, that helped make it all work. So if you'd like to help us, you can donate. We do have a, an Amazon charity wish list. So we put up uh, different pieces of equipment um, or office supplies or uh, connectors, patch cords, whatever. We, we put them up there and, and you can buy those for us and, and it'll send them straight to us. Um, you can donate with, with money, of course. So we have PayPal and Venmo. And if you uh, have us on Amazon Smile, we'll get a, a percentage of your Amazon purchases. Um, the, but the big thing we, we need is to spread the word about this so that we get campers knowing about this um, so that we, we can start to build this uh, and replicate it so that it's not just one 
camp for the entire Western Hemisphere. We have a U.S. camp. We have a Canada camp. We have, um, you know, camps all over the place, and then also have this uh, this big region wide camp that we have now. Uh, we also need people to to work us because if they're going to practice pileups, they need pileups, and so we need people to work us while we're at camp. Uh, the financial uh, contributions and all the equipment. Um, you can thank these people uh, because they made it possible for us to charge very little um, for the campers. Uh, last year, the average cost per camper was about 1,150 US dollars. Um, it looks like it's going to be higher than that this year with all the inflation going on. Um, still trying to finish all of the billing up, but. Um, you know, we, we charge a hundred dollars, um, and then they have to provide their transportation to and from Cincinnati. Uh, but once you get here, then we, we take care of you for the week, all the food, all the transportation, everything is covered and that we can do that without, you know, grants from ARDC and from WWROF and, and equipment from ICOM and, and a contribution, uh, from DX engineering and, and you know, headsets from Heil Sound and, and um, feed lines from RNL and soldering stations from Xtronic and, and contributions from Dayton. Um, those are our sponsors for this past year. Um, and then a lot of people, you know, donated things off of the wish list. And that was, that was very much needed as well and, and made um, contributions as well. So what we'd like to do is instead of telling you uh, everything that we did, we'd like to show you some of the things that we did. And so every day we have a um, highlight uh, video um, that just kind of summarizes in a couple of minutes what we did on that particular day. We don't have Fridays yet. Uh, Brian's still working on uh, on the Friday one and the week long one, but we do have a series of, of videos here. So uh, we're going to start off with opening day, which was Sunday. two um, contacts were, were pretty special. Uh, we had four 
young ladies on the very first night come up to the hotel shack um, at the end of the day and made their very first HF contact. Um, so that was that was really cool to to witness, and you got to see two of them there on the video. Uh, so campers, what what uh, what are some of your impressions from the from the first day? Don't everybody speak at once. Oh, um, oh, go ahead, Kaylee. Oh, uh, I was going to say, I really liked uh, Nathan's talk. He gave some really great insight and uh, had some cool stories to tell. It was a great keynote speaker for us. For me, I made my first contact that day. And so that was probably the highlight of, yeah, just that whole day. And it was really nice. Everyone was really friendly and I got along with everyone and learned so much. Now, now you're, I don't know, have you ever heard the story about the guy that you got your first contact with? No. Okay. So, so her first contact was Joe, right? K0NEB, right? Okay. So Joe is a very well-known kit builder. He writes articles for CQ magazine about kit building. And every year at, at the Dayton Hamvention, he wears this Dr. Seuss hat. And that's what he was talking about at the end of your, your contact so that everybody can find him easily. He, he has this red and white striped hat. Uh, so Joe, Joe's very well known. <laughs> and uh, so he was there to, to give uh, Abby and, and some others uh, their first uh, HF contact. So that was pretty cool. All right. Somebody else? I really enjoyed the tour that we had at the VOA before uh, it sort of started just to learn about the history behind the VOA and just understand where we were spending our week. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. The VOA tour was really neat, and it's probably the best place to hold a radio camp at. Yeah, the VOA tour was really fun. And then also operating a special event station. I'd made HF contacts before, but I'd never operated a special event call sign, so that was super fun. Yeah, it's kind of nice to be on on the other end of the pileup. <laughs> yeah, you know, when I first visited the museum, that, that I, I was, you know, just you know, the only thing that we don't have here is housing, and so we worked out a deal with the hotel across the street, and we we had to switch it this year at the last minute, but it, it worked out really really well. It is a great place to to have this. So, all right, so let's see. To do, we want the Monday highlights. So let's take a look at Monday. So this was Monday and, and we had, we had a lot of cool things going on, but yeah, there at the end, you saw that big windstorm come through and 
ripped that tent to shreds. That was the EME station. Uh, we were going to try EME and uh, couldn't do it. We had this this huge uh, uh, downburst come through, and uh, the the guys ran out there and and shoved all the equipment in the guard shack, and and the tent was a lost cause. Uh, we lost our flags. We lost, and it blew over the antennas at the hotel too. So those had to be repaired. And, um, so that kind of put a wrench in things on, on Monday night, but, um, you know, we had, had a lot of other good things going on on Monday. Um, we built, uh, attenu offset attenuators for, for direction finding the tape measure antennas, um, and some little, uh, 3d printed straight keys. Um, or the kit. Um, and then my personal favorite, the, the eyeball sprint with QRM. Uh, you saw me going around going, oh, uh, creating uh, the QRM. Uh, the eyeball sprint's a great way to practice your phonetics. Um, and we have a lot of fun with it. So that was, that was one of mine. So how about you all? What, what were your favorites from Monday? I would say my favorite was building the kit. Unfortunately, it was my first time soldering. So I got to solder for the first time. And yeah, I, I just really love that. I yeah, also the uh, kit building and the building the Yagi antenna. Uh, the week after camp, I was able to go to a natural resources camp. And one of the activities there was tracking wildlife collars that had transmitters on it. And I was actually able to go and use my antenna to uh, do the activity. It was a lot of fun. That's cool. I hadn't heard that story yet. So, yeah. Yeah, I got to say the the kit builds were neat. I never worked with, uh, never started on circuit on circuit boards before. I have it handy if you want me to show it, Neil. Yeah. So this is the attenuator we built. Just a. If I can get it to focus, well, it may not want to focus. Yeah, you're going to have to back it up. There you go. Okay, there it goes. That's the attenuator we built. Just a pretty simple little kit. It was the definitely one of the highlights of the week. Yeah, I really liked getting to do the kits because I'm not, I wasn't super good at soldering. So it was very nice to have help and with that. Uh, the and then also, um, it was super cool to get to use that later in the week for the fox hunt that we did. So it was the first time I had done a fox hunt with an, with an attenuator. Yeah, I kind of like that. You know, you build it one day and then you use it later in the week. And it's always kind of cool. All right. Well, that was Monday. Let's uh, go ahead to Tuesday here if I hit the right buttons.
So there you saw our, our two balloon launches. Uh, the uh, big one went up to 97,000 feet and uh, ended up only 31 miles away. So the recovery was, was pretty easy on that one. And then our Pico balloon um, that uh, was, was making its way around the globe, uh, but uh, we, we haven't heard from it in a while. So, <laughs> um, so your thoughts on, on uh, Tuesday here? I really enjoyed Tuesday. It was just so interesting to see uh, the APRS where our balloon was being received at and just how it could turn around and it's not like set where it's actually gonna go. Yeah, Tuesday was probably my favorite day. Um, there was this really cool incident where Grace and I were trying to weigh the transmitter, but we hadn't turned it off. So we couldn't get an accurate weight and we had to turn it off. That was really cool. It was really cool to just see the whole process of everything. It was a little bit complicated to me, but it was definitely worth it. It was really fun. Yeah, Tuesday was fun, which I'd always, I've been tracking W5KUB balloons for a year and a half. And to see what actually goes into launching a balloon gives you respect for the guys that do it. Yeah, and we, we've got a very good team that's worked with Bill Brown a lot and, and, um, you know, the guy who kind of started doing all this and, and, uh, uh, there's also, we worked with, uh, a group out of, I think it's Northern Illinois that, that developed their own tracking system. Uh, we did the, the one launch for them. I did throw in, I won't play the whole thing because it's, it's over an hour long, but I did throw yep, in, yep. um, a little bit of the video from the launch. So I'll let you take a look at this for a little bit. Uh, these videos are on our YouTube channel, so if you want to watch the entire um, the entire process of taking the balloon out, and filling it, and launching it, uh, you can, you can uh, start this video from the beginning. But this is uh, right at the launch. You can see the the museum. up here a little bit so here we're uh, we're getting around 30,000 I believe we caught a nice wind that that brought the balloon back toward us so that made the, the retrieval a whole lot easier It was a very slow rising balloon this time. So we did uh, lose the video at 50,000 feet, uh, which is coming up here soon. Um, they're still trying to figure that one out. They've, they've tried pressure testing, temperature testing, um, all kinds of things and cannot figure out the SD card had plenty of room. I know it says on here in the second that the SD card ran out of room. It didn't, uh, there was, there was plenty of room on the SD card, uh, plenty of battery, no idea why, why the video cut out at 50,000 feet yet, but, uh, they're working on trying to figure that out. So, uh, but the, here at the end, it'll show you the, the path of uh, of this one so yeah it actually did not run out of room we don't know what the what the reason was So you can see there, it did a complete 180 and came back toward us. So that was, that was pretty cool. Okay. So then, uh, Wednesday, here's the, the Wednesday highlights. And, uh, 
some of these are, are still pictures because we we were at king's island for the day and so we just had to you know shoot with our phones um so we don't have uh, as much video but uh it's still pretty good <laughs> Say hi. So that was a very hot <laughs> and sticky Wednesday. Um, but uh, at Kings Island, we were able to do some VHF contesting within the park um, and had, had a lot of fun. So talk about uh, Kings Island Day. I really enjoyed the VHF contest within the park because I'd never contested before and they were pretty manageable but still like a good idea of what contesting was because we only had four frequencies yeah i definitely think the uh, vhf sprints were a lot of fun just because like they were still stressful but a lot less stressful than actual contests were so it was a fun experience to do that yeah a few minutes and it's over with <laughs> yeah the contesting i think what was it five minutes so it was really quick. It's a really quick contact. It was really good, really fun to do the sprints with rubber duck antennas on HCs at that. So it was really, really difficult. Yeah, one thing I joined uh, during the second VHF contest, we had Adam. Uh, he went up in a plane, so we were able to work. I was able to work my first aeronautical mobile contact, which still even surprises me that 
that's possible, but it makes complete sense. Yeah, I had a ton of fun. It was also my first kind of like VHF contest and it was, it was just a ton of fun. It was a little difficult, a little crazy, but it was, it was a lot of fun. The hard part was timing it so that you were at the top of the roller coaster right when the contest started. That was, oh wait, that didn't happen. And may I mention, I know that a lot of people that like we had four frequencies and what were they separated by? Like maybe five kilohertz or so, 20, 20, 20 kilohertz. Yeah. yeah. We uh were bleeding over on every, every channel. So whoever chose frequency to call, you're bleeding over really bad. So you know, a lot of people got mad about that with the QRM. I know uh, a few people complained about it, but I think it, it made it even more fun. Yeah. We got to adjust to the situation. So. Yeah, and then yeah, Chris KD8YVJ is is studying to be, be a pilot. He was one of my uh, helpers. Uh, he's a local, and um, he's like, "Hey, I'll I'll just go up in the plane and do aeronautical mobile." So they flew right over us and had a friend that was flying right behind him, um, and took uh, Adam with him to operate the radio. So we got uh, aeronautical mobile contacts on on Wednesday. Okay, so then Thursday came along, and we have what what we like to call the the Kings Island hangover, <laughs> because we were all exhausted from from the the heat. Uh, the heat index was like one hundred and five, and you know, twelve hours in an amusement park. We, we were all kind of worn out. So Thursday, we were, we were dragging a little bit, but uh, well, let's uh, let's take a look at Thursday here if I can get the mouse in the right place. Thursday uh, was about satellites and, and direction finding. And Grace, why don't you talk about the satellite since you helped uh, run that one? Yeah, it was a really good experience to have other people and get them interested in satellites. Um, I pulled up my, the log that I turned in. Uh, I made We made about 35 contacts over with my station that I had set up. And then I think Ruth made 10 or so more. So we had a good amount of contacts there. Um, 
I think it was a good experience. And I think we got, I don't know, four or five other youth to operate Whiskey Yankee while I held the antenna. And then you got a, a nice little uh, surprise. I did. Um, at the end of the week, I won a nice radio. Yeah. And and you also had a bit of a surprise uh, contact. Oh, yeah. So after I got home from camp, I worked in A1SS. Uh, that's the call they use on the International Space Station. So I was able to talk to the astronaut and talk to him. Uh, at camp, we did hear him. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get in, but uh, it was pretty low pass. But I was able to work in this weekend for field day with the field day, the club call, and then my call also. Oh, that's cool. All right. So thoughts on Thursday? I got to work my first satellite. So I think that was just really exciting and fun. I think that was probably my highlight for that day. Now, just hearing the astronaut was the highlight of my week overall, just getting to hear a uh, welcome aboard the International Space Station. It's the neatest thing I've ever heard in radio or just got to hear it just to receive it. Yeah, I really enjoyed getting to hear the astronaut, but also making satellite contact. I tried a couple times before at field days and stuff, but I'd never actually made a satellite contact. So that was super fun. I also enjoyed the satellites, but I thought the fox hunt was also really fun. It was kind of challenging and hard at first trying to figure out how exactly to use the attenuator, but once we figured it out, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, and then we had uh, pizza and pool party and everything to finish things up. And then on Friday, we we don't have the uh, we don't have the video for Friday yet, but Friday we built uh, an infed half wave dipole kit. And then we had the, uh, the closing ceremonies uh, where we did give away um, a couple of radios from uh, RNL. Uh, we gave away two ID 52 uh, handhelds and uh, gave away a bunch of prizes for uh, different things throughout the week, some gift certificates, <clears throat> that kind of thing. Um, for some of the competitions so uh, that was Friday and then then everybody went home so um, we don't have that just yet okay so let me show you some of the numbers here uh, and then we'll we can do some questions um, but uh, we we surveyed everyone at the beginning of the camp and then at the end of the camp um, and so one of the questions we asked was, how would you rate your ham radio ability? So, you know, five, you're an expert, one being you're a beginner. And the mean uh, response was 2.84. Um, and at the end of the week of camp, that came up to 3.48. Um, you can see, you know, the numbers are, are a lot better. Um, and we're, this is kind of the same trend that we saw from last year's data. Um, so we're just kind of using some of this qualitative data to, to kind of track how we're doing. Um, this one was how comfortable are you to be on the air? Uh, we started out at a 3.58 and we ended up at a 3.9. Um, so it really skewed to the, to the high end on this one. Um, rate your contesting ability was 2.42 came up to 2.90 um that you know people were able to practice a little bit and find out uh you know how they do with contesting um how would you rate the, the sessions uh we had all fours and fives um the mean was a 4.86 so um we, we think we're doing something right here <laughs> uh, at least that's that's what uh, the surveys are telling us and then overall, how would you rate the camp as, you know, almost all fives. Um, so we're, you know, I think we're on the right track here. Um, would you recommend it to someone else that's a ham? Every single person put it at a five. So, you know, that tells us this is working. Um, I've also seen, um, from the group last year, uh, you know, they were hanging out with each other at Hamvention, uh, 
you know, I could tell that there were a lot of friendships there that, that weren't there before and the youth are getting to know each other. And that's one of the big things that, that we want. So where are we headed? Well, um, you know, this year was a transition. We were trying to ha train uh, some of the uh, older youth to um, run the camp in the future and make a lot of those decisions. So a lot of that training was accomplished. And so they're going to be taking over more and more of that responsibility um, in the next year or two. Um, we want to rotate this uh, camp around all of the Americas because this camp is for North, Central, and South America. And so we need to rotate the location. So uh, we will not, uh, well, well, I shouldn't say we will not, we will most likely not be back at the Voice of America Museum for a few years because we want to rotate this around. So uh, we actually got our first application uh, for a host uh, a couple of days ago. And um, so if you're interested in being a camp host, which what that means is you're going to put up the antennas, you're going to make all the local arrangements for housing and food and that kind of thing. Um, you don't have to come up with the money. You don't have to come up with the programming that we do all that. Uh, but we need a location and we need people to, to, you know, gather things up and accept shipments and, and, um, you know, host the camp. Um, if you want to do that, the deadline, uh, is rapidly approaching. It's, it's June 30th. Um, so check out our website, youthontheair.org, and you can apply to be the 2023 camp host. We also, again, want to add some sub-regional camps. So there's like a Western U.S. and an Eastern U.S. and a Canada, and, you know, in addition to this camp that rotates all across the, uh, the Western Hemisphere. And then uh, my next big job is going to be putting this weekend camp together um, for children under 15 um, to come with a parent and have a miniature version of the camp over a long weekend. So um, we'll have a feeder program basically for, for the other camp. So that's, that's where we're headed. Um, so if you have questions or you want to check us out on uh, line, here is how you do that. Youthontheair.org. Um, we have links to not just our stuff, but we have links to all these different youth programs. So like RHR and yacht and, um, you know, all these different programs for youth. And we try to really advertise when there's a youth event or, you know, scholarships or whatever, we try to, to put it all in one place. So that way, um, you've got one place to go, youthontheair.org. Uh, we are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and YouTube. And like I said, you can watch the entire opening and closing ceremonies. You can watch the balloon launch uh, in its entirety um, up on YouTube. So you can check that out. We do have a mailing list, so you can go in and sign up, and you will get our uh, news releases as we send those out. Um, my assistant director was Adam Johnson, KD9KIS, um, and he's going to be taking over more of the uh, responsibilities in the future. Um, we also had several people in the working group um, this year. It was four of the adults that kind of co-founded the first one, and then four of the campers from last year. Um, so Frankie, Jocelyn, Taylor, Sterling, Sam, and Ruth, um, round out the the working group so these eight people are the ones who planned everything uh put everything together um made all the contacts borrowed stuff um to make it all work and if you want to contact any of us uh, our email address is our first name at youthontheair.org so i'm neil at youthontheair.org adam um, who is handling the host applications for 2023 is adam at youthontheair.org and et cetera. So uh, if you'd like to contact us, that is how you do it. So uh, again, you know, our, our big goal is, is to keep the hams that we have. Um, it's, it's really important to recruit new hams and really important to recruit new young hams. 
but we also have to do something for after the license has been earned um, to to create this community that that a lot of us experience again like just like this one that, that we're here tonight um, we have a lot of people that have different interests and different um, knowledge bases that we can pull from each other and, and learn from each other and that's really what we're we're all about so um, I will turn off all the the video stuff and we will take some questions and uh, we can we can do that I can take those or the campers uh, I like to like to have the campers do a lot of that but I can certainly jump in where needed so okay well raise your hand uh, or put something in chat we'll pick you up and we'll go from there yeah see somebody worked this during field day or during field day uh no we weren't on for field day this year um not sure what that was um but yeah yeah we've got a lot of 11 year olds um says i am interested especially in regional and under 15 my ham son is 11 um for some reason 11 seems to be <laughs> like a really popular age um so and I, I met a 12 year old at field day the other day and it's like, you know, you're too young, you know, and, um, and, and it's not that, that we, and let me say this too, it's it, the, the age requirement. Cause I, I have a big problem with age requirements because I got my license when I was five and the class had an age limit of 13. And, and that was because they didn't feel like anyone under 13 could do ham radio. And so, yeah, I kind of proved that wrong. Uh, it, it's not that under 15 can't do ham radio because we know they can. Uh, it, it's, it's purely a, a social thing. Uh, you know, 12 years old and 15 years old, two totally different animals. Uh, you know, uh, so we, we really need to, to kind of split that up socially. It's, it's not that, you know, they can't do ham radio. You know, I got an email just this morning from somebody that's, you know, got a son that's six that got his license. Uh, you know, I was five. I know there were some that, that were four that got their licenses. Uh, it, it, it's about the social aspect. And so we just want to separate, you know that out but we we definitely don't want to ignore those because there's a lot of 11 year olds out there okay uh dale asks how did the young people get started in amateur radio and what license level are they so why don't we just go around and let them answer i can kick it off so got uh, introduced to radio about three years ago didn't really uh take with it just had the book and just kind of sat on the shelf collecting dust. And then COVID happened and decided I would read the book and take the test for my tech. Didn't expect to go any further. And then got my license. Uh, the guy that got me into radio, his name is Mike, uh, call sign K4MWK. He uh, taught me to go ahead and get my general and I have ran with it and stuck with it since and uh, really enjoy the hobby. I'm a general class license. I'm studying to get my extra. I am stuck on the circuits. So I'm just trying to, figure that out once i figure that out i'll probably be an extra here before summer's over with for me um, was... sorry. go ahead you're good all right uh so i started with ham radio when i was 11 is when i got my technician's license and i'm still tech class but i'm working on my generals i'm really close um but i got into it because my dad's been a ham radio operator since he was a teenager and then I just took the class with my mom. Uh, since then, I've done like some volunteer work with like marathons and stuff. And then we found out about the camp and this year was my second year going. Um, my grandpa has been licensed since he was probably 14. So I kind of had a family connection there. And then a school club also started when I was in fifth grade. So I joined that. And then I passed my tech when I was 10. And then after that, I got general and extra kind of close to the same time my mom did. Uh, she'd taken her tech in middle school, and then we tested for the next two license classes together, which was super cool. 
but I'm an extra now, so it's fun to be able to do this because it's a lot of it is with my family. Like I just got my younger sister licensed. Well, I didn't get her license; she studied, but um, I helped her get licensed, so she has her tech. I think she's ten, so it's kind of been a family thing for me. Yeah, sort of like Katie, it's also a family thing for me. My grandpa's been licensed 61 years now. I got it a year ago, um, just out of respect for him for 60 years and working with his K at YSE stroke 60. But I'm enjoying it a lot more than I expected I would. And I hold an extra class license. I first learned of it through Civil Air Patrol and they had a class just about ham radio and to pass your technician. And I had no idea, but I signed up. I'm like, this sounds really cool. And then after that, so this was last November. And then I passed it in probably December. And then I recently passed my general just a few months ago. And I'm working towards my extra. Um, yeah. Um, to answer mm -hmm. Oscar's question. Oh, yeah, quick, um. For me, the, I think the reason that I haven't stopped pursuing amateur radio is because there's so much stuff you can do within it. So like if you get bored with one thing, you can just go to a different aspect of it. Right now, I'm kind of working on Morse code. So I, I actually teach classes for the Long Island CW Club Kids classes, intermediate and advanced. So it's kind of pushing myself to get better at certain aspects and then looking at new ones as well. I'm very involved with my school's amateur radio club. So I kind of, like when I went to Yoda camp, I wanted to go partially because once I see like what people are doing and what gets kids more interested, and once I could see how stuff was being done by people who were really good at it and really familiar with it, I kind of wanted to take some of that back to the school club so that we could sort of get stuff like that done. I wanna do a balloon launch with the club and just stuff like that. So I think probably getting better in certain areas of ham radio is what motivates me most. Yeah, I can so, go ahead and uh, Barry go ahead, asked about local clubs. How you go ahead, go ahead Anderson. Okay. Um, I do participate in a couple of clubs, member of the Central Kentucky Amateur Radio Club, um, WA4UXJ. I run a local night on Friday nights for the club. I really enjoy doing that. And uh, their field day activities this past weekend, uh, did field day with them as well. There's a few other clubs in the area I uh, don't really, not members of, but kind of associate with, uh, Lake Cumberland Amateur Radio Club. Um, I know they're active on YouTube and whatever else. Um, taught how active on their repeater. I talk to those guys quite often. But what motivates me to be an amateur radio operator, really, that's uh, Parks on the Air. I really enjoy Parks on the Air. I just did a Parks activation this past week. Um, it really helped me uh, develop skills in terms of just working pileups. And uh, it really helped me learn to work pileups and how to pass traffic on the radio. It was really, really helpful in terms of learning how to contest. And it's just one of the things I really enjoyed doing. Um, I set a goal for myself every time I go out to make 50 contacts, just so I know that it just to sharpen my skills. So that's one of my, that really what's motivates me to not give it up. And like Kaylee or uh, Katie said, there's always something to do in radio. So if you get bored with one thing, just move on to another one, satellites or fox hunting or balloons, or just find something else to do and you'll never get bored of it. So I personally am not part of a club at the moment. There aren't very many ham radio clubs in my area because I live in kind of a remote, a remote area. Um, but I am working with my parents to uh, start a ham radio club for 4-H, hopefully this fall. And um, I think what motivates me for ham radio is like just getting to meet new people. Um, I met a lot of hams when I did the class to get my license. And then like through Yoda and stuff, I've been able to meet a ton of awesome people. I'm not uh, too active in any clubs uh, locally, but I do participate in Yacht. That's uh, through Echo Link, but uh, I participate with the local club and some of the some of their nets, but not too active with them there. But I really 
am staying in the hobby with all the awards you can get. I'm trying to work all the 488 grids on satellite. So um, it's a real challenge there, but that's sort of what's keeping me. And then once I get that, just start working DXCC and pileups and just keep pursuing all the different awards that you can get in the hobby. I'll answer the club question real quick. Um, I am president of my school's amateur radio club, so I'm very involved with that one. Uh, in terms of clubs outside of my school, I go to meetings every once in a while. I am a member of one. Um, this past weekend for field day, I was at a couple different club setups. So I kind of, I don't really stick to one. I'm not members of all of them, but I do like to go around to different ones in the area. I'm currently trying to get into more clubs because I'm fairly new to all of this, but I've attended the emergency communications one for Queen Creek where I live. And so that's been pretty fun, just getting to know more people. And I met someone actually like 10 minutes away from me that's the same that's the same age as me so that was really exciting I didn't know there were many youth around me um what motivated me just like everyone said it's it's just so fascinating you can do so much with it and you never get bored and it's just so so interesting to me it's hard to explain I just I just love it so much All right, we have any more? I don't hear any more. So thank you for the opportunity to, to be here and uh, for, the, for the campers to be here and tell you uh, all about Yoda and uh, you know, the next thing we do have a Yoda contest coming up. Uh, the second round of the contest is here in a couple of weeks. And then, uh, in December, make sure you, uh, you work those, uh, young people and spread the word about the, the Yoda month. Uh, we can sign up more operators and, and get everybody going, um, you know, during Yoda month and try to try to get them on the air. Tammy's got a hand up. So let's see here. Oh, and Don. Hello, Tammy. Hmm. No, Tammy. Tammy? Oh, hello. Is everybody gone or are people still here? We're no, here. We're Go ahead. ahead. Okay, my my eleven year old, the eleven year old I was talking about wants to tell why he's interested. I am seven and uh yeah, I got I like when Nancy says my mom, my dad, my Cuba We'll keep at it and make sure you, you sign up for Yoda month. Be one of our operators. That'd be great. And uh, keep us in mind for camp. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's see. Was it Dawn? Had a hand up. You know, Dan, uh, it would be interesting that these youth, any of these youth that they have really good experience to come in and get in contact so they can present what they are doing as a youth into the community. That will attract other people and also will show that they are really doing so much activities and encourage and 
At the same time, they can get advice from other people like the uh, online Elmering and things like that. So they can, they can, it could be an open section for the, for sort of, they can develop even more and more and more. And, and now that we have this technology, you don't have to go exactly to a club meeting. It can be done by anybody from Hawaii or New York or California or Texas. And that would be great if, if we give them a forum that they can talk and, and discuss this type of questions and, uh, and advice. And we, we should hear their experiences as they grow up and develop themselves. I see Barry um, says, uh, I wonder if there's a genetic draw to electronics. Seems these young people all had relatives that had licenses and that that's true. But I will say this, when I taught, uh, you know, at Bloomington South uh, and had the ham club there, uh, almost three fourths of my kids were banned at kids. I don't know why, but they were in the band. And okay, the cat has to be on camera. Uh, you know, for CW, it kind of makes sense because it's rhythms and, you know, and everything. But I, we didn't do CW <laughs> most years. Uh, you know, when, when we had some interested, we did it. Uh, but for some reason, a lot of, my, a lot of the band kids were, were in ham radio. I don't know if anybody else has noticed that that trend or not but uh peter wants to know about digital modes so you all want to talk about digital modes thoughts on digital modes yeah i'll, I'll start digital mode conversation i like digital modes I, I do a lot of ft8 so i think most of my um, countries that i have for dxcc are on ft8 I have a lot of ft8 i'm trying to pull up my logbook here um have a lot of ft8 i can see well, I don't know if i can get to it but digital is my is my go-to especially if uh, i have somebody in the shack with me to want to talk i can still operate radio but have have a conversation with them because it's just looking at a screen and kind of clicking so i really enjoy it for that and then um the long distance contacts and where it's a really short bandwidth it will, it will get through most of the time if digital is open I can uh, at least talk to Europe if I wanted to. Uh, I have not tried any digital modes yet, although I think I really, uh, I would really like to get those set up for at least the school club. We operate in the school club roundups twice a year and then field day sometimes as well. I think that digital modes would be a really good way to kind of get the mic shy kids on the air because a lot of the kids that we have in the club are mic shy, at least at first and some really do not want to talk. So I think that that would be a really good way to get them on the air and maybe kind of ease into it a little bit. Yeah, it was my experience when I did high school. Some years it was exactly that. It was, hey, let's get on digital. We don't want to have that mic in front of us. And then other years, I don't want to do all that typing. I want to get on, you know. So it, it really, I think it depends on the on the group that you have. I haven't done too much digital. I'll do um, some FT8 here and there, but I really enjoy making the voice contacts with people and just seeing where our signal can reach. I haven't done any digital at all, but I really hope to get into it. And yeah. If we had time, I wanna add one more thing on the digital. Um, whisper. I haven't messed with whisper, but I really enjoy whisper because I know you can track airplanes with whisper. I know that's a big thing with the Malaysian Airlines flight right now. So I think whisper is really neat. Um, just to kind of know where your signal's getting out with the, just to blow power and whatever antenna you have. I know a lot of guys here local use it just to see where they're getting out to. And I've been trying to get into it. I just don't really know how to set it up. I need to talk to a few guys about getting it set up with my radio and then but I really enjoy whisper too, just kind of seeing where your signal can't get out to. And then in terms of how, what all it can do as well. All right. Anyone else?
Okay. Well, again, thank you for having us. Um, and, um, thanks for, for inviting us to be here and, and again, spread the word, let people know that, that we exist. Uh, that's the big thing, you know, youth on the air org, And, uh, we'll do our, our best to, uh, keep everything, um, you know, posted up there so that, uh, young people know how to get in touch with each other and what events are happening and scholarships and all that. Um, be sure to check us out at youthontheair.org and I will say seven, three and turn it back to net control. <laughs> all right. I, I was going to leave a note thanking you, but I figured I'd better speak up. Yeah, um, you better. The future of the amateur radio service kind of depends on what you're doing. And, uh, us old folks that just sit back and let you do it all to yourself. Well, shame on us. Um, get, getting new people into the avocation, and it is much more than a hobby for most folks that take it seriously. Uh, so you youngsters have all really impressed me and shamed me, actually, in many ways. So keep doing what you're doing. You, you're definitely the future, and you'll be better than we are. All right. Thank you, Dan. Um, are there any other comments or uh, anything before we close this up? Thank you, everybody. Thank you all for coming. It was absolutely wonderful presentation. It has been very much so. Uh, it's been a delight. You must understand, most of our presentations have a lot of gray hair and, and so <laughs> forth. And <laughs> this has been refreshingly great. In fact, that Neil, if you don't mind, after we close out of here, I'll like give you a phone call and uh, discuss some stuff with you and see what you think about sure. this and that. Sure. Okay. Uh, if there's no, nothing else out there, I'm going to wish everybody a 73 and uh, look forward. Well, we have another one tomorrow, so look forward to you tomorrow. So 73s, everybody. Have a good one. Good night, everybody. Don't forget to have the youngsters invite their friends to the Thursday night sessions. Because, um, you know, that's where the, the, uh, uh, the, how do I say this? Emergency communication. Well, yeah, <laughs> that, that, that's where that goal is discussed in uh, great depth. And I think uh, anybody getting involved in amateur radio probably has to give that some thought. And the more disasters and the more local the disasters you live through, the more significant you'll understand uh, how the ability to communicate via the amateur radio service is. So it's like, you know, until you're done without, you don't appreciate. <laughs> um, I just have to make a comment. When we get older, our memory has a problem, and this is a good example of it. Okay, 73s, everyone. <laughs> it's been a big, it's been a pleasure right now. 73.